Chapter 1, A Country in Need of a Hero Incompetence is often highly regarded in governmental circles. William Wallace Before we speak of William Wallace, it is appropriate to discuss the historical background in which he was found. Before the English invasion, Wallace's native home of Scotland had a long line of kings and potentates dispensing home rule, and for the life of William Wallace, it was the reign of Alexander III that would be the most pivotal. King Alexander III's rule would come to an abrupt end in 1286 as the result of an unfortunate accident. The king was only 44 years old when his horse ejected him from the saddle and threw him to his death. At the time of Alexander's death, Scotland was in a good place. It was doing well economically, it was protected militarily, and it was fairly stable socially. But the king's sudden demise threatened to tear this once durable social fabric to shreds. The reason why Alexander's death was so troubling was that due to a set of tragic circumstances, he had no heir apparent. First, his wife and queen passed away in 1275. Then, six years later, his son David perished only to be followed by the passing of his daughter Margaret in 1283. If all this wasn't enough, the grieving king was next beset with the loss of the only child he had left, his oldest son and crown prince, Alexander, in 1284. As dreadful as the circumstances were, the king put the country ahead of his own feelings and sought to establish a new heir from the rubble and wreckage of his life. By the end of 1285, Alexander had remarried, and Scotland welcomed their new queen, Yolanda of Drew. At the time of Alexander's untimely death in March of the following year, Yolanda was already pregnant, but when the pregnancy ended in a stillborn child, the beleaguered Scots were forced to look for another solution to secure the line of succession. Alexander's closest living relative was his infant granddaughter Margaret, the Princess of Norway or, as she was otherwise known, the Maid of Norway. It was this young maiden who became the Queen-designate of Scotland after Alexander's last child was stillborn in 1286. Because of Margaret's young age, she remained in Norway while six Scottish nobles, the guardians of Scotland, ruled as regents in her stead. In 1290, when Margaret had turned seven years old, it was decided that she should be sent to the British Isles and, at last, be officially crowned as the Queen of Scotland. But once again, tragedy struck. En route to her new home, Margaret fell violently ill and died, crushing any chance of a peaceful transition of power in Scotland. With Scotland threatening to descend into all-out civil war in the ensuing power struggle after Margaret's death, King Edward I of England was asked to come to Scotland in a last-ditch attempt to mediate a solution to the crisis. But before the proceedings could even begin, Edward insisted that he should be declared the Lord Paramount of Scotland until a rightful heir had been found, essentially reducing Scotland to a vassal state of the English crown. This then led to a formal hearing taking place in early November of 1292 in which John Balliol was chosen as the new King of Scotland. John proved to be a weak king and was often referred to as empty coat since he allowed Edward's constant interference in Scottish affairs. The discontent over John's rule and English encroachment would steadily increase until riots waged by the unhappy Scots and subsequent bloody reprisals leveled by the English became commonplace in Scotland. This was the environment in which William Wallace spent his formative years. Chapter 2 Early Life and Legend any society which suppresses the heritage of its conquered minorities, prevents their history or denies them their symbols, has sown the seeds of their own destruction. William Wallace Born circa 1272, William Wallace was around 20 years old at the time of John Balliol's, and by extension, Edward I's, rise to power in Scotland. Although not much is definitely known about Wallace's early life and family history, most historians agree that Wallace was a member of the lesser nobility and had two brothers named John and Malcolm. In the traditional view, Wallace's father was Sir Malcolm Wallace of Eldersley, which would make Wallace's birthplace the county of Renfrewshire on the southwestern shore of Scotland. Wallace's own seal, however, states that his father was named Alan Wallace, giving rise to the claim that Wallace's true birthplace was in fact a village called Eldersley in the nearby county of Ayrshire. If this village did exist, it has since been lost. There are many local legends surrounding William Wallace, most of which are impossible to verify or debunk. One of these tales tells about how Wallace's father was killed by an English knight when Wallace was a boy, effectively creating his lifelong desire to expel the English from his country. According to tradition, this was the first personal casualty that would haunt William Wallace in his long struggle with the English, 
and he would never forget it. Since the day his father was murdered, his heart burned with revenge against those that had inflicted such a tragedy upon his young life. However, there is no proof to support this version of events, and some records suggest that Wallace's father was indeed alive at the time of Wallace's uprising against the English. Another story tells of one of Wallace's first open rebellions against English authority. In December of 1291, when Scotland was anxiously awaiting the appointment of a new king, an English soldier named Selby picked the wrong time to harass young Wallace. As is typical during foreign occupation, it was quite common for the English occupying troops to bully and lord over the Scottish populace whose obedience and submission to their superiority they took for granted. But on this December day, it was the Englishman Selby who would get the short end of the stick. Selby apparently confronted Wallace at random in the street, haranguing him about the clothes he was wearing. Selby derisively shouted at Wallace, Thou Scot, abide, what devil clothed thee in so gay a garment? An Irish mantle were the right apparel for thy kind, a Scottish knife under thy belt to carry, rough shoes upon thy boorish feet. Selby was deriding Wallace for wearing nice clothing, telling him that he should wear the meager and poor clothes of the Irish. He was also insinuating that Wallace should give him his blade, but the only way William Wallace was going to give this Englishman his blade was by driving it deep into his heart. Catching his abuser off guard, Wallace answered his taunts by quickly grabbing his tormentor's shirt with one hand, jerking him forward, while he thrust his knife into his chest with the other. Gurgling blood, Selby fell to the ground and died. The troops that accompanied Selby immediately sprung toward William Wallace, but some Scottish citizens nearby, who had borne witness to the abuse, weren't about to let one of their own get slaughtered so easily. Crowding the soldiers, the Scots provided Wallace with enough time so that he could get away. Not wasting their efforts to save him, William Wallace bolted and took off in the other direction, running all the way to a townhouse that one of his uncles owned. His uncle's housekeeper answered the door, and after Wallace filled her in as to what had transpired, she came up with a plan to help him evade detection. If this story can be believed, keep in mind that much of what has come down to us about William Wallace is hearsay, the maid disguised Wallace as a seamstress and set him to work on a spindle in the corner. As a result of this subterfuge, when the English troops barged into the home looking for Wallace, all they saw was a mild-mannered maid and what they thought was her assistant spinning away in the corner. The ploy worked, and although Wallace was now an outlaw with a price on his head, he was still a free man. After Wallace had been convicted in absentia for the death of the English soldier, he was branded a fugitive, and the English authorities were actively seeking to hunt him down. Staying one step ahead of his pursuers, Wallace found refuge with yet another uncle, Sir Richard Wallace, in February of 1292. Here, in the town of Rick Carton, Wallace was supposed to lay low until English attentions were diverted elsewhere, but it wasn't long before he would find himself afoul of the English once again. According to one story, he had been at his uncle's home a matter of months when, on April 23, a simple fishing trip almost proved to be his undoing. Without even considering bringing a weapon or another means of defense with him, Wallace left his uncle's house that evening with only his fishing pole. He clearly wasn't looking for a fight, he was merely looking to catch some fish for his uncle's supper. In this, he was successful, catching a large amount of fish in a short amount of time. The catch was so great, however, that it caught the eye of the English army who was patrolling the area with a small company of men. The group began to interrogate Wallace and then demanded that he hand over the fish he just caught. Wallace immediately protested and tried to reason with the soldiers, telling them that he needed the fish for supper. The men would not listen to him, however, and proceeded to seize the fish by force. Wallace was both unarmed and outnumbered, so his prospects of fighting back didn't look good. Besides, he was still attempting to keep a low profile, the last thing he wanted was another conflagration. Still, these Englishmen stoked the fires of rage that burned inside of Wallace, and despite his earnest attempts at resisting the urge to succumb to madness, an outburst of anger would indeed be the result. He tried to inform the men one last time that he needed the food for an elderly knight, most likely referring to his uncle, and that they were in the wrong for taking it away from him. The fact that Wallace questioned their actions was enough for one of the soldiers to pull out his sword and take a swing at him. As soon as he did, however, these would-be aggressors were in for the shock of their life. They had no idea who Wallace was and what he was capable of. All they saw was what they thought was a meek, albeit impressively tall, Scottish fisherman. 
but as soon as the blade came toward Wallace, his reflexes took over. Without even having to think about it, he immediately knocked the sword from the attacker's hand with his fishing pole. With adrenaline and rage pumping in equal measure, he then quickly dove for the sword and picked it up off the ground before the dumbfounded Englishman could even respond. In a matter of seconds, Wallace sent his requisition sword flying into the stunned soldier's neck, felling him with a single blow. Finally gathering their wits, two of his compatriots dismounted from their horses and ran toward Wallace with swords raised. They were decimated just as easily, as Wallace once again sliced into one of his attacker's necks and then, with the fluid motion of a dancer, wheeled around just in time to chop off the arm of the other pursuing soldier. The Englishman's hand was still clutching his weapon as both sword and sword arm came crashing down. The grisly death that Wallace had so artfully dealt was more than enough of a demonstration to send the few surviving troops into a full retreat. Wallace was victorious, but his cover was blown. Quickly, he returned to his uncle's home to inform him that he had to depart. It is said that he then took one of the horses belonging to the English soldiers he had slain and rode off to the woodlands of eastern Scotland to seek some higher ground where he could hide.